I'm David Bawley, you're watching Atheist Edge. If prayer worked, ambulances would take people to churches instead of hospitals, and believers would have longer lifespans than the general population. Don't think that humans have a genetic propensity for faith in deities? The religion of the Yananan tribe of Vanuatu is based on the belief that Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, is God. I would actually reword this as don't think that humans have an inborn propensity for faith in deities? After all, if it was genetic, the Paraha people of the Amazon would have a god belief, but they are one of the very few peoples on the earth who don't. According to Daniel Everett, who has worked with them, the Paraha have no concept of a supreme spirit or god, and they lost interest in Jesus when they discovered that Everett had never seen him. They require evidence based on a personal experience for every claim made, so good for the Paraha. Rather than there being a specific gene or genes that encode for religious faith, it could be convincingly argued that the genetic makeup of humans has allowed the evolution of a pattern-seeking brain that has led mankind throughout history to seek patterns and come up with explanations for this seemingly inexplicable. I go into detail in this in my book. As an example, if you're a Stone Age Homo sapiens and you've just experienced an earthquake followed by a volcanic eruption for the first time, you've got no answer for what's going on. But when an elder of your tribe says, this has happened before, when we trespassed on land where we weren't supposed to be, we are being warned by some great power. It's easy to see where ideas of powerful agents that are otherwise unseen could come from. Any country that attacks Jerusalem will fall into a drought and its people will turn into zombies. Rainbows were created to remind humans that God will never drown them again. It really depresses me that something so beautiful is a vague threat that we can see at all times. If you knew that, God, that people were going to be such a problem that you were going to have to start over, um, I don't know why you wouldn't just do it right in the first place. And also, you're punishing people for the free will that you've given them. Rachel allowed her sister Leah to have sex with their shared husband in exchange for some mandrake roots. Biblical family values, everybody. God instantly struck 50,070 people dead just for looking in a box. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of Yahweh, even he smote of the people fifty thousand and three score and ten men. And the people lamented, because Yahweh had spitten many of the people with a great slaughter. I picture an endless procession of people walking by the ark of the covenant, dropping dead on the spot and bodies piling up like a mountain of cordwood. Or the ark placed on the 50-yard line of a crowded football stadium and all the spectators dropping dead at the same time. Nick Peters says, One of the first new facts of Halls is about the incident in 1 Samuel with 50,070 people dying for looking in the ark. He pictures people lining up and all dying when they look at an event like a football stadium and everyone dying at once. Funny! I picture someone who doesn't bother reading scholarship 
and now agrees that the text should more accurately read 70. Of course, Hall has never been one for reading contrary thought. He has to avoid that cognitive dissonance after all. Okay, so Nick is not telling us the whole story here. The majority of Hebrew manuscripts uh, for this section have two numbers here, 50,000 and 70. So it's a bit weird on the face of the text that they would do that, if for no other reason that it seems like that's kind of way too many people that would be living in a single town at that time. But this is the number for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why. Somebody, maybe, maybe somebody made a mistake. That's another issue. This is the number that's in the text. And there are more manuscripts that have the bigger number for whatever reason. Who cares? Uh, let's say that Nick is right. Let's say that the 50,000 was some sort of weird goof up on the part of the biblical writers. Because it's, again, it's there. It's in these, you know, multiple, multiple manuscripts. Um, but let's say it's 70. 70 people. 70 people were killed by looking inside a box. That's better, isn't it? Does, does it? Does that, <coughs> does that actually make it better? I think it's still a super weird story. 70 people. That's a lot to get around a box, right? So it kind of depends on how quickly Yahweh killed them. I guess that's the real question. So was it instant? Did they just sort of line up, peek in, and bloop, drop dead? Did that happen one by one? You're still going to have to come up some with some sort of weird situation where people are lining up and filing past the box and just dropping dead and just kind of keeping going. That's that's weird. That's that doesn't seem like something that could happen in real life, even with just seventy people. Um, maybe everyone just sort of like <coughs> hung out all afternoon, You're like milling around the ark. Hey, let's peek inside. Okay, cool. And um, maybe eventually, like once they got to the end of the day, the like the very last dude there, the number seventy, uh, he was the last one to look inside. And once once they got to that sweet spot number, that seventy number, Yahweh was like, "Okay, now you're all dead." Boom, and just. Bzz. Um, either way, buddy. <laughs> This is a weird ass story. And, and this is the reason why, right? So you're familiar with Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm sure, I hope. Uh, God, how young are people these days? Do they not know classic movies? Um, but if you go to the climax of Raiders of the Lost Ark, you see the same sort of concept being used here, right? So you've got the Ark, they've, they've captured it, the Nazis have. They've got it up on this altar. You can still only fit three guys around the Ark, right? You've got Nazi leader, Nazi leader guy, and then Belloc uh, in the back wearing some sort of what he thinks is like a high priest outfit. It's still just three people around the Ark. The other guy, nobody else there can actually look inside the Ark, right? Um, eh, we don't really care because those, those three are the ones that we really want to see die, right? They're the real bad guys. I mean, the other the Nazi soldiers that are there, they're bad too. Like, they're Nazis. But we don't feel the same sort of visceral, like, disgust at them the, the way that we do the other guys. Um, but, <laughs> you know, Spielberg is directing this movie. And, you know, he knows the story in First Samuel and, and these other stories about how the Ark is so dangerous and deadly. Uh, and can kill multiple people at a time. And that's the whole premise of the movie is that Hitler wants to get it because it's some sort of a weapon of mass destruction, right? So what's the point of, of a weapon of mass destruction if you can't kill a lot of people with it, right? So uh, so Spielberg wants to show this. So he's got all these Nazi soldiers there. And they don't do a thing where everybody files up and, and looks in the arc one by one and then dies. Because uh, obviously that would look stupid. So instead they have this weird thing where all this... They're not looking in the arc, but there's all this stuff coming up out of the arc. And it's not exactly clear what it is. It's like, you know, it's, 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 is it smoke? Is it steam? Is it... Is it is it power? Is it, you know, there are these like ghost things, but are they ghosts or are they angels or are they demons? If they're demons, why are there demons in the ark? Why are there angels in the ark? Why is there anything in the ark that's like that? It's not clear, but they've got to have something to come out of it so that the Nazi soldiers can interact with it because otherwise the whole thing just seems stupid. Um, 
and then in the, in the climax, once uh, the the one guy starts melting, or the everything starts melting off of his skull, and the other guy just sort of collapses in some melty mess, and then uh, Belloc catches fire and then explodes. There's lightning that shoots out and it hits everybody simultaneously. So I guess Spielberg made the call, right? So it only really makes sense if it's a simultaneous death thing that happens. So maybe that's what happened in the story. I don't know. But it's it's <laughs> whatever was the case. It, it, it's got to be fantasy, right? You can only see uh, a representation that, that makes any sort of sense in a movie where it's all make-believe, right? So as make-believe, sure, fine, whatever. Um, but, but we can't take that seriously. No, no way. Solemn oaths can be broken anytime you want. Vicarious redemption, also known as substitutionary atonement or scapegoating is arguably the most vulgar and immoral tenant in the Bible. The idea of a blood sacrifice of a goat or lamb in the Old Testament or a human Jesus the Lamb of God to pay for the transgressions of another is central to the Christian faith. As Thomas Paine once said if I owe a person money and cannot pay him, and he threatens to put me in prison, another person can take the debt upon himself and pay it for me. But if I have committed a crime, every circumstance of the case is changed. Moral justice cannot take the innocent for the guilty even if the innocent would offer itself. To suppose justice to do this is to destroy the principle of its existence, which is the thing itself. It is then no longer justice. It is indiscriminate revenge. And nobody could get this point across better than the hitch. Vicarious redemption is the most repulsive teaching of Jesus. The idea that by throwing your sins onto somebody else, you can have them abolished. The moral rot of Christianity is exposed in, in its central doctrine. Lastly, if God wanted to give humans an alternative to the in eternal punishment that he imposed on them, he wouldn't have waited 200,000 years to send an alternative to that punishment. For billions and billions of years, the divine plan has been doing just fine. Now you come along and pray for something. I think George Carlin said it best. Well, suppose the thing you want isn't in God's divine plan. What do you want him to do? Change his plan? Just for you? Doesn't it seem a little arrogant? It's a divine plan. What's the use of being God if every rundown schmuck with a $2 prayer book can come along and fuck up your plan? Instead of fighting for the abolition of slavery, Christian leaders of that time used the Bible to defend the practice. For example, prominent Baptist minister Reverend Thornton Stringfellow used the Bible itself to prove that slavery was sanctioned by God. Jesus Christ put a system of measures into operation which have for their object the subjugation of all men to him as a lawgiver. At a time, too, when hereditary slavery existed in all, and after it had been incorporated for 1,500 years into the Jewish constitution, immediately given by God himself. I say it is passing strange that under such circumstances, Jesus should fail to prohibit its further existence if it was his intention to abolish it. Job himself was a slaveholder, and like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, won no small portion of his claims to character with God and men from the matter in which he discharged his duty to his slaves. If therefore doing to others as we would they should do to us means precisely what loving our neighbor as ourself means, then Jesus has added no new moral principle above those in the law of Moses to prohibit slavery. For in his law is found this principle and slavery also. 
Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, and they shall be your possession, and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. I ask the candid man if the words of this institution could be more explicit. It is from God himself. It authorizes that people to whom he had become king and lawgiver to purchase men and women as property, to hold them and their posterity in bondage, and to will them to their children as a possession forever. And more, it allows foreign slaveholders to settle and live among them, to breed slaves and sell them. Some apologists attempt to explain away the Bible's endorsement of slavery by quoting Luke 6.31, Do to others as you would have them do to you. However, this verse is not an admonition of slavery. Moses said basically the same thing in the Old Testament, Love thy neighbor as thyself. Therefore, Jesus added nothing new which would have prevented slavery. The debate about biblically mandated slavery has been going on for centuries, and I probably couldn't add much to it that hasn't already been covered. Some Bible believers of the time were for slavery, and some were against it. But I'll use this opportunity to point out a broader, more general argument that can be used not only about slavery, but any immoral aspects of the Bible, such as misogyny, racism, genocide, execution of unruly children, vicarious atonement, and infinite punishment for finite thought crime. All of these things would be, in the modern secular world, labeled as unquestionably immoral. So how does the believer reconcile with the obviousness of this seeming truth? With the logical fallacy, the argument from authority. They are, in essence, saying it doesn't matter what in this time we think about these things. God himself has decreed it. Jesus has allowed it. The likes of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have sanctioned these things. They are our authorities when it comes to deciding what is permissible or not. What is moral or not? Who are you to question their obvious authority? Of course, once you point out that none of these characters can be proven to have existed or the biblical accounts verified and authentic, their position collapses like a house of cards. 